Abrams, a Democrat, is an attorney and former state legislator. Shane Hazel, a libertarian, is a veteran and podcast host. Brian Kemp, a Republican, is the incumbent governor for the state of Georgia. Now let's meet our panelists. Jennifer Bellamy is an anchor for 11 Alive in Atlanta. Greg Bluestein is a political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And Chuck Williams is a reporter with WRBL in Columbus, Georgia. For complete rules on today's debate, please visit the Atlanta Press Club website, atlantapressclub.org slash debates. To start the debate, each candidate will be asked two questions. Candidates have 60 seconds to answer each question. Chuck Williams, you get the first question of Stacey Abrams. Thank you, Donna. Ms. Abrams, public opinion polls in our state show support for the right to abortion, Medicaid expansion, and banning assault weapons. You are on the side of public opinion in each of these issues, yet you are behind in almost every poll. Why? First of all, thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity to address the communities of Georgia. The reason people are on my side are because, it's because I'm on the right side of history and on the right side of the issues. But we also know that polls are a snapshot. The question is, who are they taking a picture of? When I'm going across this state, the people I'm talking to are excited about this election, but they also know that they're often left out of the conversation. Students who have found themselves struggling to finish college because they don't have access to financial aid, families that are struggling to decide between food on their table and healthcare costs families raise, facing rising prices, and everyone I've met is afraid of the gun violence and the rising violence in the state. I do not believe that I'm behind. I believe that I'm making the case for Georgia, the case for electing me as the next governor, because the current failures we have seen in this state are not only damning, they are disqualifying. And over the next few years, we have an opportunity to change the trajectory of the state, and I look forward to leading our state forward. Thank you very much. Greg Bluestein, it's your turn to ask a question of Brian Kemp. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Governor, in recent weeks, two recordings have surfaced in which you left the door open, or you appeared to leave the door open, to questions about whether you'd push to ban emergency contraceptives and whether you'd back a statewide ban on the destruction of embryos. Can you tell us right now whether you'd push for these measures or any other additional restrictions on abortion now that the 2019 law is in effect? No, I would not. I mean, look, we were at many campaign events, People come up, secret recordings, couldn't completely understand the conversation that's going on, but no, that's not my desire to do that. Georgians should know that my desire is to... been on and it's what it will continue to be on. Thank you very much. Jennifer Bellamy, your question for Shane Hazel. Mr. Hazel, Georgia seems to be struggling right now in dealing with how to legally take on the issue of cannabis in the state. What do you think needs to be done here? How should Georgia address the issues surrounding marijuana? I guess a perfect question for a libertarian. Um, we believe that cannabis is a plant that grows from earth naturally. And the hubris that the federal government has shown in making a Schedule One drug while also holding patents on it is one of those things where we find it somewhat laughable. And it is. It is a right of people. It is medicine. It is something that we can add to our industry here in Georgia and really displace a lot of what comes in from outside of Georgia. This is a huge win for Georgia. We have a great agricultural sector. We can grow two bumper crops of cannabis every year. The idea that it is still un illegal and that Brian Kemp has talked about this and tweeted about it as it is a good thing when we make cannabis bust and cannabis bust only is a, is a real sign that the government in Georgia is using it for the prison industrial complex, for the, the law enforcement complex to go after communities that would like to see freedom in this area. So it's a right. That's how we see it as libertarians. Right. Thank you very much. You may, you have a rebuttal? Yeah, I would just like to make sure people at home know that I have been doing exactly what I told them I would do when I was campaigning for governor and now that I am your governor. Uh, we have been going after street gangs and drug cartels. So the things that we're tweeting out there is when our great men and women in law enforcement 
are, are making drug bust, bust, not from recreational use. It's a plant. Other things. But, but that's what my focus is on. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Greg, please ask a question of Stacey Abrams. Yeah, Ms. Abrams, in 2018, you didn't concede defeat to Governor Kemp. And you talked to systemic problems with the state's election system. This election, do you commit to accept the outcome of the vote, regardless of what it shows? And do you stand by your use of words like rigged four years ago to describe the state's election system? In 2018, I began my speech on November 16th acknowledging that Governor Kemp had won the election. I then proceeded to lay out in grave detail the challenges faced by voters under his leadership as Secretary of State, including the 10 plus two who were arrested in Quitman, Georgia, because they had the temerity to use absentee ballots. I told the story of students who were denied access to the right to vote, even though they had duly registered. 80,000 complaints had come in by that day, and it took four years of federal investigation in a lawsuit that was the longest running voting rights lawsuit in the state's history, in recent history, that proved us right. Now, we didn't win every single claim, but we forced massive changes to the election laws. And unfortunately, Brian Kemp and Brad Rapsenberger have decided to restore their greatest hits. Just today, a homeless woman was denied the right to vote in Forsyth County because she could not, she did not receive a provisional ballot because she had been challenged. As governor, I intend to stand up for the right to vote. I will always acknowledge the outcome of elections, but I will never deny access to every voter because that is the responsibility of every American to defend the right to vote. Thank you, Brian Kemp. Rebuttal. 30 seconds. Well, I would just say uh, that Ms. Abrams is going to do a lot of attacking of my record tonight because she doesn't want to talk about her own record. In 2018, in the governor's race, we had the largest African American turnout in the country. She said that Senate Bill 202, our recent Elections Integrity Act, what we passed two years ago, would be suppressive in Jim Crow 2.0. Just this past May in our primaries, we again had record turnout in the Republican primary and the Democratic primary. In Georgia, it's easy to vote and hard to cheat. If and I'd respond. like to add just a second here, as the Libertarian, 30 seconds although, for you, you. although you will push for people to have access to going to the polls and voting, you're not pushing ballot access. This is a huge, a huge oppression for people like the third parties, the people that want to get their people on the ballot. We have, I think, 20 percent Democrats, 20 percent Republicans in the state of Georgia. That leaves 60 percent of people in Georgia unrepresented by ballot access laws that both of them support. 30 seconds, Ms. Abrams. Actually, to correct Mr. Hazel, I co-sponsored legislation to expand ballot access because I agree with you that third parties should have better access to the right to vote in the state of Georgia. Never I co-sponsored it, it with, a, with one of our independents in the state legislature. But let's be clear about ballot access and voter access. Brian Kemp was the secretary of state, and he has assiduously denied access to the right to vote. We know that the right to vote is the only way that we can make the changes we need in the state, the only way we can make the changes we need in this country, whether it's access to the right to an abortion, the ability to take care of our families. We need a governor who believes in access to the right to vote right. and not in voter suppression, which is the hallmark of Brian Kemp's leadership. Thank you very much. With, We're with, going to with move all, on. With all due respect, I was called out. I, I would like to just the record reflect as my time as secretary of state, I'm the person that created the online voter registration system in this state where any Georgian can vote, register to vote 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So for someone to say that we have been suppressive in our state when we've seen turnout increase over the years, including with minorities like African Americans, Latinos and others, is simply not true. And again, Ms. Abrams is going to lie about my record because she doesn't want to talk about her own. All right, we're well, going to move on great, here. And that's the yeah, case. We're going to move on here, Ms. Ha Mr. Hazel. Uh, Jennifer, your question for Brian Kemp. Governor Kemp, several hospitals and medical centers across the state have announced or gone through with plans to close their doors, leaving a gap in care and a reduction in services at a time when our health care workers are already suffering from burnout, from increased demand and workloads. Many are now facing care that will be delayed or unavailable, while our state's capital will soon have only one level one trauma center. What will you do to ensure Georgians have access to critical health care services and hospitals? Well, I, I would just remind voters at home, there's also hospitals being built uh, across this state and new options for people for health care. Look, the AMC situation was something that was thrown on a lot of political leaders, including me. But instead of complaining about it and doing the blame game, I went and worked with Fulton County, with DeKalb County, with Democrats to come up with a solution that put state resources into Grady to help make sure people have the access and the care 
that they need in our state. And I'm committed to continuing to do that in the future. All right. Shane, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Chuck, you get the final question to Shane Hazel. Thank you. Mr. Hazel, you ran for Congress in 2018. That was just four years ago you ran as a Republican. You got less than 30 percent of the vote in the Republican primary. What happened between then and now that made you a libertarian? Oh, I, uh, I actually came back to my, my roots as a libertarian. Uh, we believe in freedom. We saw what the Republican Party was. We saw what the Democratic Party was. They are force and coercion. No matter what they talk about, it's force and coercion. Whether it's a certificate of need for hospitals, whether it is taking guns away from law-abiding citizens, it is always force and coercion at the point of a gun from the Democrats and Republicans. To look at life through consent, the eyes that, hey, we can all have transactions, we do it every day in the private sector. 99.9% .9 of us go throughout our day without raping people, without murdering people, without pointing guns at people to take their property. That is not what the government does under Republicans and Democrats, period. That's how I became a libertarian. Uh, this is why we're going to send this thing into a runoff. And if people were really looking for something to change, you'd vote libertarian. You'd send a message to both of these parties because the, one of these people will most likely be the executive in a rigged system that you want to be more free. Thank you. That concludes the first round of the debate. The candidates will now ask a question to each of their opponents. Candidates will have 30 seconds to ask the question, 60 seconds to respond, and the candidate who asks the questions will have 30 seconds for rebuttal. By random selection, Brian Kemp, you may ask the first question to Stacey Abrams. Well, thank you very much. Um, as many people know, I have over 100 sheriffs endorsing my campaign, uh, several of which are Democrats. And my question for Ms. Abrams tonight is how many Democrat or how many sheriffs statewide have publicly endorsed your campaign? Mr. Kemp, what you are attempting to do is continue the lie that you've told so many times. I think you believe it's the truth. I support law enforcement and did so for 11 years, worked closely with the Sheriff's Association. I'm probably the only person standing here who's ever actually written a, a SOP for police department when I was working for the city of Atlanta. But I have two brothers, one who has committed crimes, and I want his victims to be able to call the police and get the help they need, and I've always supported that right. But I have another brother who has faced being pulled over for driving while black when he was coming back from his job as a social worker. Unlike you, I don't have the luxury of relying on slogans to describe my position on public safety. I believe that we need safety and justice, because I love both of my brothers. And like most Georgians, I lead a complicated life where we need access to help, but we also need to know that we are safe from racial violence. While you may not have had that experience, too many people I know have, and that is why I will always stand up for making certain that safety and justice are the conversations we're having in Georgia and the delivery we have as the next governor of Georgia. Thank you. 30 seconds, Mr. Kemp. Well, I would just tell people that, look, I support safety and justice. The Ms. Abrams refused to answer the question, so I'll let you know that the answer is zero. No sheriffs are endorsing her statewide because of her stances on wanting to defund the police, eliminate cash bail, and serving on the boards of organizations like the Margaret Casey Foundation that supports and gives grants to organizations that are promoting the defund the police movement. If, he, if I may respond, because he actually lied there. Yes, I do seconds. have the support of sheriffs, but unlike Mr. Kemp, I do not make it my plan to list every person who supports me. I have the support of sheriffs. I have the support of advocates. I have the support of victims. I have the support of those who want to be treated fairly in our system. I have to have conversations with the entirety of Georgia. I don't have the luxury of being a part of a good old boys club where we don't focus on the needs of our people. And that is why my mission has been to put out very concrete plans explaining how I will serve justice, how I will serve safety, and how I will serve the citizens of the state of Georgia. 30 seconds, Brian Kemp. Well, look, I, I would just tell people, I know Ms. A Ms. Abrams is upset and mad um, because these are things that she said. This is not me making this up. This is things that she said in interviews that she's done and she's sitting on organizations that you can go look at the facts yourself. And that's why the men and women in law enforcement want a governor that is going to stand with them, who has been with them, not only to have their back, but also stand shoulder to shoulder on things like civil unrest and going after street gangs and human traffickers. Thank you very much. Stacey Abrams, you get the next question for Shane Hazel. Mr. Hazel, Republicans and Democrats have raised the alarm 
over the rise in the Chinese Communist Party backed companies purchasing American farmland. To date, they've purchased more than one million acres of farmland in the state of Georgia. Would you agree with Mike Pompeo that allowing those purchases in the state of Georgia is a sign of madness? And would you be concerned about the national security implications of the Chinese Communist Party purchasing this land with the support of the state of Georgia? I see the setup for this question. I understand why it was projected at me. Um, as libertarians, we believe that you own your property and that the state can't take it away from you and can't sell it or can't determine who you sell it to. Um, the CCP, obviously, uh, which is going through some of its own internal unrest right now, uh, I believe is probably purchasing this with things like central bank digital dollars and yuan. Uh, which are also coming down to a, uh, a critical nature where people are in uprising in China. What we need to look at is how these purchases are being made. Are we accepting fiat, CCP, yuan in Georgia as a actual currency? It's about as good as the U.S. currency, the fiat currency that we're about to have hoisted on us in terms of a CBDC. I'm not going to tell you or anybody else as governor how or who to sell your property to. And I imagine that in the end, the, mar the free market will work itself out. Thank you. Stacey Abrams, 30 seconds. The state of Georgia is watching our farmland be purchased by the Chinese Communist Party. And while that is not normally a conversation that we have, it is something that we should be concerned about. Agriculture is our number one industry, and Georgia has 13 military installations. The fact that the state of Georgia is working with the Chinese Communist Party using one of their technologies that both Donald Trump and Joe Biden have warned is very much a national security threat should be of great concern to every Georgian. This is not about being concerned simply about who's owning the land, but it's about how much access to our information they have because of the state. Thank you. Shane Hazel, you may ask your question of Stacey Abrams. Yeah, I'd agree with you. The uh, military industrial complex is a big problem. It is. And the fact that we have people trying to come here to, I don't know, get a get a backdoor into our, our military. Um, I think one of the things we should be talking about as Georgians and as executives is the Defend the Guard Act, where our military has been used very, I don't know, haphazardly around the world to go and take resources from the Middle East or now in, in Mr. Ukraine. Mr. Hazel, your this question. Is, yeah, this is my question to who? To Stacey Abrams. Uh, oh, we've already switched gears. Yeah. My, my, my question to you, I'm sorry. It's I, okay. I have hearing problems, guys. Um, my question to you is, I mentioned CBDCs. As the executive of Georgia, when we come into a CBDC from the Federal Reserve, will you, as the executive, accept the, the CCCP style uh, currency? I believe that the conversation about currency is a complicated one. And part of the challenge we have is how these how this currency is transmitted, the very real security threats with digital currency, the hacking and mining of that digital currency should concern all Georgians. As the governor of Georgia, I will work very closely with the Federal Reserve, but also with the innovators and the entrepreneurs who do see an opportunity. But before we take a step forward that could put us at risk, our responsibility is to understand the complexity of what is happening with these transactions. And as exciting as it is, we also know it's deeply problematic when we do not have the adequate safeguards in place. That's one of the reasons I've raised concerns about WeChat and about the purchase of farmland. But what we know overall is that we need a governor who is conversant in these issues, who understands that, for example, in the state of Georgia, we have access to $3.5 billion in American currency that could be delivered tomorrow to save our hospitals and to save our lives. But our current governor has refused to accept those dollars. My intention is to do what's best for the state of Georgia every Thank single day. Thank you. Shane Hazel, you get a 30-second rebuttal. Yeah. Working with the Federal Reserve, who's got us into the mess that we are in right now, because of a centralized fiat currency, it will be absolutely worthless. They will be dangling carrots in front of the governor, in front of the executives, in front of the legislature to do exactly what their mandates are. If they are mandating that they take the property of people, then they will do it. If they want to invade your homes, your privacy, your businesses, they will do it because of CBDCs. All right. Stacey Abrams, please ask your question to Brian Kemp. Absolutely. Mr. Kemp, under your leadership, there is currently a 100-year gap 
between minority-owned businesses and majority-owned businesses. Although minorities comprise 48% of the population, they only generate 12.2% of the business revenue in the state. And under every analysis that we have seen, it will take 100 years to close that gap, given the current process that you have in place. You served four years in the Senate, eight years as Secretary of State in charge of businesses. You served four years as governor. What are your concrete, specific, targeted plans to decrease and address the racial equity gap currently facing contracting and purchasing for minority-owned businesses. Governor Kim? Well, I would remind Georgians that the first part of my plan was keeping our state open for business and allowing all business people and working Georgians to work when Stacey Abrams was criticizing me for doing that. Also pushing to get our kids back in the classroom when, again, Stacey Abrams was criticizing me for doing that. A lot of Georgians, including African Americans and other minorities, cannot go to work if their kids are not in the classroom. We had the lowest unemployment rate in the country for African Americans. We also were named uh, the top, we're in the top 10 of the states for black entrepreneurship uh, in the state of Georgia. So our economy is incredible and we will continue to work with all of those entrepreneurs in the days ahead and working class Georgians because we are the ones that have been fighting for you when Miss Abrams was not. We were giving tax refunds. We were doing tax cuts. We were suspending the gas tax to help you deal with 40 year high inflation when she was criticizing us. Stacey Abrams, 30 second rebuttal. I would point out that Mr. Kemp did not address the needs of purchasing and contracts for black and brown owned businesses, which is what he has refused to do for the last 16 years. We know that $10.9 billion has been delivered to the state of Georgia through two recent acts at the con congressional level. And Brian Kemp does not have a plan for making certain that people of color have access to those contracts, access to purchasing. It was only in July of this year that he finally acknowledged that there might be a problem. He has said that we need to study it. I would tell him just cheat off of my paper. I know the answer. We need a governor who actually believes in equity, racial equity, Thank economic you. equity in the state of Georgia, and I will deliver. Thank you. Shane Hazel, please ask your question to Brian Kemp. Brian, in 2020, on April 2nd, you locked down Georgia, threatening peaceful people with force and coercion. You called people in Georgia non-essential, and it killed millions of jobs. You bent the knee to big pharma and pushed a vaccine that was untested on people, and it has killed people. They have lost their loved ones. You've allowed bureaucracy to invade our businesses. And then you had the audacity to brag about record tax revenue. You want to say sorry to anybody? So is that a question or? That is a question. Do you want to say sorry to anybody? Uh, well, look, I'll be glad to talk about my record because obviously uh, Mr. Hazel is gravely mistaken. If you look at the executive orders uh, that I signed, we said every business in Georgia was essential. There was a few that we asked to help us stop the spread, flatten the curve, build PPE supplies and hospital bed capacities. Because unlike him, I was getting the calls from hospitals saying, hey, we are out of surgical gowns. We're out of masks. We need ventilators. And we were literally working 24 seven to supply those items while also keeping our economy open in this state. And as you know, I was the first state to open the small parts that we asked to close, and our recovery has been as good as any state in the country. We have had two record years of economic development because of our business environment, working with the General Assembly to make sure that we're putting Georgians first and Georgia businesses and Georgia workers first, and that's what I'm committed to continuing to do. 30 seconds, Mr. Hazel. You should have put Georgia freedom first, period. You didn't have the power to lock down businesses. And you signed the executive order on April 2nd. It was clear as day. I sat there and watched you do it. And I was like, there is no coming back from this. The idea that the, the def I guess the default was to lock down Georgia instead of trusting Georgians with their freedom to adapt in a time of very changing circumstances, I think is a tyrant move. And I think the left and right are fascist and communist socialists, whereas we're talking about real liberty, trusting Thank Georgians with those decisions. Thank you, Mr. Hazel. Brian Kemp, you have the final question in this round for Shane Hazel. Well, I, I would just uh, ask Mr. Hazel if he supports the things that we have done because we were open and Georgians were working and we've had excess revenue. So instead of doing big government- That's our tax money. Yeah, no, I don't support it because Your here's question? the thing is when, when when we get to that point, when we talk well, about what you're doing, ask, ask my, oh, my, finish my, your my question. question, please go ahead. I, I would just I'm say, sorry. do you support 
the tax cuts we've done, returning a billion dollars of taxpayer money and suspending the gas tax for Georgians to help fight through 40-year high inflation and bad domestic energy policy. Georgia, I hope you hear me when I say libertarians think taxation is theft. It's your money. It's your property. Yeah. You should be able to determine what you do with it. I don't support the fact that you haven't ended qualified immunity. I don't support the fact that you haven't ended civil asset forfeiture. I don't support the fact that you haven't ended the drug war. You haven't ended nonviolent crime. You haven't ended cash bail. You haven't ended no-knock raids. You haven't implemented community review boards. And you haven't bland, uh, banned blacked-out cop cars that go after people for more money. It's ridiculous. De-escalation by the executive to leave peaceful people alone in the state of Georgia. That's my message to both of you, to everybody in the state who wears a badge. <coughs> Stop going after peaceful people. Mr. Kemp, 30-second rebuttal. Well, that's simply not true. Uh, as Georgians know, I have followed the laws and the Constitution of this state. And I ran after, on going after criminal street gangs because I knew there was an issue in our state when other people wouldn't even talk about it and the media wouldn't acknowledge it. And you look at the amount of fentanyl that's coming across the southern border because of bad border policies from this administration, every governor in the country is having to deal with that. So, yes, I'm going to go after bad people that are selling bad drugs and killing our children and our other citizens. The free market way to do that would be we're, to allow cannabis and psilocybin to handle the mental health issues. Mr. Okay, Hazel, well, I wasn't talking about cannabis. I was talking about deadly <laughs> Gentlemen, Stop busting them then. Gentlemen, we're going to move on. That concludes our second round. For those just joining us, this is the general election debate between candidates for governor. We will now go back to the panel to ask questions to the candidate of their choice until we run out of time. As a point of moderator privilege, I may also ask questions of the candidates, and I will determine when a rebuttal is appropriate. And I'm going to use that moderator privilege right away to ask some education questions. Mr. Kemp, if reelected, you've said you'll push for $65 million dedicated to fighting pandemic learning loss, more, hiring more counselors, and recruiting teachers to fill shortages. How do you respond to those who say you should have prioritized those academic related issues over laws dealing with divisive concepts, parental laws, and obscene books in the past legislative session, even those who were pushed and pushing for those laws in the end say they don't have much teeth? Well, look, we have been pushing for those things. You can talk to school superintendents around the state. We have worked with them uh, really over the last year and a half, two years on learning loss. We've been working with our superintendents and other education groups. We've passed two different pieces of legislation dealing with the teacher pipeline, which is getting more teachers into the system. Our plan has, uh, is working with higher education, including our HBCUs and others, to make sure we're getting more of the right people and, and more of them in the classroom to help mentor our children. This is really just the next step in the process. We are funding K through 12 education in this state more than we ever have per pupil ever. And that's coming off a recession during the middle of a global pandemic. This includes my promised teacher pay raise of $5,000 that we completed in my first full term, despite having to deal with two years of a global can uh, pandemic and a recession. So I think it's incredible what we've been doing, but make no mistake, we have more work to do and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Shane Hazel, would you tell us your education plan? Yeah, it's to put it in the hands of the private sector. The government education system that came from Prussia in the 1700s has obviously failed Americans. We don't understand economics. We don't understand our civil culture. We don't understand a whole lot about what goes on behind the scenes in, in politics. The, the idea that we want to privatize everything as libertarians is good for education. Think about Walmart having a monopoly on force to teach your children. It's insane. The idea that we do this with a government has side effects. It, we see them on a, on a daily basis. We need to get government out of education. We need to allow parents to seek out the best education for their kids. And we also believe that they have the responsibility to do so. So to help fix this nation, uh, start here in Georgia, is get the government and the admin out of the classroom and get it out of our lives. Thank, Thank you. you.
Ms. Abrams, in education, you propose a boost in teachers' pay, more state-paid preschool slots for lower-income children and their families, and more. If you win the governor's race, you'll likely have Republican majorities in both chambers. Given what we know about part of partisan divisions, how will you get your education proposals passed and funded? So let's begin with what my proposals are. Georgia is sitting on a $6.6 .6 billion surplus. That's money that we have after we've paid every bill, after we've put 15% aside for say, a rainy day fund. That is money that after we've accounted for increases in population. And I want to invest it in our children and in our families, beginning with making certain that we have pre-K slots. We have four-year-olds on a waiting list. I've never met a four-year-old who waits to turn five. But we can solve that problem with the money we have right now. We can also give an $11,000 pay raise to our teachers instead of a $5,000 pay raise on layaway. We can make certain that we are increasing access to the pipeline because teachers aren't in the pipeline because they can't make enough money to take care of themselves and their families. And that is why under this governor, we have a 67% retention rate. Any other CEO who lost more than 30% of their workforce would be fired. And that is why my plan is to use the resources we have today to plan for today and tomorrow. We've got the money, and we have economists in Georgia and national economists who have looked at my plan, and they say it works. Check my plan out at StacyAbrams.com. Check my map. It works. Thank you. 30 seconds. Yeah, I'd just like to let people know that, look, my plan is to use the revenue that we have because we've been open. If Stacey Abrams had been your governor over the last four years, you wouldn't have that excess revenue because she wanted the state to stay locked down and criticize me when I opened it back up. We have, in fact, been using this revenue and will do so in the future to do another income tax refund and put the money back in your pocket. We're also going to do a property tax relief grant one time that helps you with rising property values and rising property taxes that the counties are not rolling back. Thank you very much. If I may respond, because 30 it, it, seconds. It, it, this is going to go back and forth between Ms. the Democrats for and the Ms. Republicans. If they keep for attacking Abrams, each other, please, I'm going to say this is move a on. Cooler, Ms. Abrams, 30 seconds. For Mr. The, Hazel, I, I'm, we've got to move we're on. We're not going to be excluded from this. I'm we're not gonna, excluding you, but I'm the, he did the, refer to her, so we are going to have her speak first. You're going to take money well, and property from my, people that don't even attend your schools because Mr. they Sir, don't Mr. agree Hazel, with them. We want to move on. Ms. Abrams? I want to point out three things that were inaccurate. One. I urged caution because any leader should pr privilege the lives of those they serve. 38,000 people died in Georgia. We have one county where one in every 100 Hancock County residents perished under this governor. And so, yes, I urged caution. But I also urge good math. We have the money in our accounts to do what is right. Money not delivered by Brian Kemp, money delivered by federal Democrats, and money that is delivered by hardworking Georgians who have generated the surplus, and they deserve investments in their lives. And the income taxes that we keep hearing about, 50,000 people Thank are you, getting Ms. half Abrams. a billion dollars. The rest of us are going to see 193 bucks. Thank you. That uh, is not Abrams. a good return on investment. Shane Hazel, 30 seconds, please. It's and stolen then we money. All well, of it's stolen money from people who have property. The fact that we have property tax in America has got to be one of the most un-American things I've ever heard of. There are a lot of us at home school because we don't believe in the government school system. And we are still fleeced every year to the tune of thousands and thousands of dollars to pay for a broken school system that we don't agree with. That's right. both of you guys. Well, Donna, sorry. With, with all due respect, Ms. Abrams called me out again. All right. About these 30 impacts. seconds, and, and then be, we really are brief. going to move on. But the federal money that we're able to use right now and spend is because our state was open, and we didn't have to use this federal money to backfill state revenues, which has put us in an incredible position uh, to move forward in our state. Mr. So, Kemp, so we're one blame, of several states that so have had the same this, exact to blame experience. This but Ms. On, it is disingenuous. To claim and not having done a conversation. This on your own. We are going to move on. It's the people's we're, money. We're going to move on, uh, gentlemen and, and Ms. Abrams. Greg Bluestein, you have the next question. Ms. Abrams, I want to go back to one of uh, Donna's underlying questions, which is the how issue. Absolutely. Uh, you've staked out dozens of policy proposals that would have to win approval from lawmakers, including Medicaid expansion, including uh, several of the proposals you outlined here today. But it's highly likely the legislature will remain in Republican control. How are you going to win approval of these measures uh, when in the face of staunch Republican opposition? Well, I don't actually believe there is staunch Republican opposition. I served in the legislature for 11 years. And every day during my tenure, I worked across the aisle to get good done. They put it in my title. I was minority leader, meaning I couldn't win unless I could work with others. That is why I'm the only person I know of who got an A rating from the Georgia Chamber of Commerce and the Friend of Labor Award for the same work in the same year. 
The work that I do is working with people to find out how we get solutions. Medicaid expansion is a perfect example. We have 19 hospitals at risk of closure, joining the six hospitals that have closed under this governor. We are sending a Brinks truck of $3.5 billion of our money to Kentucky, to Louisiana, to Ohio, because this governor will not accept the money. And the resources that we need in our state will come to our state when we have leaders willing to work across the aisle to bring our money home. But it's more important than that. It's about how do we take care of our families? How do we make certain that we're addressing high housing prices? How do we tackle the issue of gun violence? How do we support our freedoms and protect our people? And we need a governor who can do the Thank math, but also do the morality of making sure we take care of every single Georgia. Thank you, Ms. Abrams. Governor Kemp, you have 30 seconds. Well, I would just say that one way we deal with gun violence is to take the bad people that are doing the shootings and lock them up and not in cash bail like Ms. Abrams wants to do. But listen, she's also said that the silver bullet on health care is Medicaid expansion, adding 600, 650,000 people. Well, there's been 600,000 people added to the Medicaid roll since I've become governor. And the problem is it's a broken government program that she wants the government to decide your health care that will also kick 200,000 private citizens off their private sector health care. Thank you. I may respond. 30-second like rebuttal. Just, just Wait, talk about he this. He called just her name. Second. Ms. Abrams, you have a 30-second rebuttal. This is ridiculous. Number one, Medicaid expansion will allow 500,000 Georgians who are working people to get access to health care. That is a good thing in a state where we have people dying every day from cancer, from issues with health, issues with diabetes, issues with heart disease. But number two, the 600,000 people that he references who are on Medicaid, they are put there because of the public health emergency. And when that ends, they will lose health care, which will add more people who are on the streets unable to get health care. Under this governor, we've lost six hospitals. We have ambulance wait times that are excessive, right. and our Thank people need would, relief, and like they need their money back. I would like to wait. We want to we want to give our panelists yeah. a chance to ask more but questions. So, Chuck Williams, it is your we're turn to ask a question, Mr. It's insane, Governor. The Democrats have controlled the U.S. Senate for two years because Georgia shifted from two Republicans to two Democrats in January of 2021. One of those seats was held by Kelly Leffler, a person you appointed to that post. She then lost to Senator Warnock. Do you wish you had made a different choice when you selected Kelly Leffler? Well, no, not at all.
is the default position. Not more government, not more programs, not more policies, not more point at the barrel of a gun forcing coercion. It is freedom. All right. Brian Kemp, your answer to the question. Well, I, I'll first, since I didn't get a rebuttal after being called out, would we'll just let Jordans know again that my record's being attacked because Ms. Abrams doesn't want to talk about her own record. If you look at what the state of Georgia and our first lady, Marty Kemp, has done to raise the awareness on ending human trafficking, going after the perpetrators and supporting the victim, as well as us working with the General Assembly to give Medicaid benefits to, new, to birthing mothers up to a year uh, after having that child and other things, shows you our state that we value life and that we care. But in the future, my focus is going to be what it was when I opened the debate, and that is helping you fight through 40-year high inflation and disastrous policies in Washington, D.C. I would remind you that Stacey Abrams campaigned to be Joe Biden's running mate. She supports these policies that have raised taxes on hardworking Americans and Georgians when they promised they would not. We're working with the General Assembly to help you fight through that by suspending the gas tax and giving your money back to you in your much. pocket. Thank you very much. Greg, your next question. Hey, Governor, I want to stay with you um, and, and talk about something that just came up in the last exchange a little bit. Earlier today, you rolled out a new public safety plan that, that offers a crackdown, promotes a crackdown on criminal offenses. What it doesn't specifically address is gun violence. Your critics say that your permissive gun policies will only lead to more crime. What do you propose you will do in a second term if you're reelected to address gun-related crimes? Well, again, we're, we're going after the people that are doing these gun-related crimes. I mean, and that's what we're doing going after uh, street gangs in this regard. You know, during the pandemic, when I was talking to people about how we were responding, what we were dealing with, I was hearing from educators and athletic directors and other people saying, Governor, we got to get our kids back in the classroom because we're losing them. We're going to lose them a decade of children because these kids that we're recruiting when they're 13, 14, 15 year old, years old to be on the ball field or be in the band or be on the robotics team or what have you, extracurricular activity, they're being recruited by street gangs because they're not in the classroom. So those are the kind of things that we are focused on to make sure that these kids are under the right environment. And my new public safety plan is stiffening penals, penalties for gang, uh, gang members that are recruiting our children. And I believe that most Georgians support that. And I'm committed to working with all law enforcement to make a dent there. Thank you. Chuck Williams. Uh, this is for Governor Kemp and Ms. Abrams. Columbus, Macon, Atlanta, and other communities have benefited from a Georgia State Patrol task force that has helped augment police coverage in those cities and some others over the last year. What can be done to make sure that local agencies, agencies that are short on officers, can handle these police, policing duties without having to rely on the state? Ms. Abrams? Well, yes. you actually asked Mr. Kemp for I said for both. Okay. Yeah, it's for both. Governor. Yeah, look, I'm glad to uh, answer that question. The crime suppression unit that I asked Colonel Wright to put together during civil unrest when I grew tired of local elected political leaders that wouldn't let their local law enforcement go after dangerous people during civil unrest that had no chase policies where street racers and street gangs are terrorizing our citizens. I told Colonel Wright, I wanted to plan, I wanted to know how much it's going to cost, and I want to know who we're going to work with. And so that's why the State Patrol, GBI, Department of Natural Resources, game wardens, working with the Fulton County Sheriff who's helped us with jail facilities, the Atlanta Police Department, we went and put a plan together to start going after street racers and going after violent criminals and have more boots on the ground. We've done the same thing in Columbus, we've done it in Macon, we've done it in Savannah, and we'll do it wherever we're needed. This is not our job. We're using funds from the governor's emergency um, uh, uh, fund to help pay for these dollars. And thankfully, the General Assembly supports that because we've been in the fight when others were not. Thank you. Ms. Abrams? Street gangs did not shoot six Asian women going into a gun store, getting a weapon, and murdering women in less than an hour. Street gangs aren't the reason people are getting shot in grocery stores and in parking lots and at schools. 
Street gangs are one part of the problem, but we have a governor who has weakened gun laws across this state, flooded our streets with guns by letting dangerous people get access to those weapons. Georgia does not have a waiting period. We do not have universal background checks. And one of the few permits that we had that was helping keep us safe stopped 5,000 people who should not have had weapons from getting them, got weakened by this governor with his criminal carry law. As the next governor, my intention would be to actually give the people who do 90 percent of law enforcement the support they need. We know that they have asked for at least $136 million so they can recruit and retain officers. I am the only candidate who's put in place a plan for at least $25 million in grants, not loans, to go to these local law enforcement officers so they can recruit and retain officers so that their officers aren't working two or three jobs simply to make ends meet. Thank you. Before your rebuttal, uh, Governor Kemp, Shane Hazel, Thank you, you may much. respond to this question. You keep going back to guns, Stacey, and I think it's going to be your undoing here in Georgia. Georgia, we're going to have less and less gun laws, whether it's under Republicans or Libertarians. Libertarians don't believe in any gun laws. We believe that you know how to best protect you and your property. And the biggest mass murderer in history is government. It's not private citizens. Most private citizens, like I said before, go throughout their day without doing any harm to anybody. However, the people in the government with all of the guns still go after people with a badge when they shouldn't have to. In Holly Springs, Georgia, I introduced the Helios Initiative, where we got rid of civil asset forfeiture. It was a one-page bill through decentralization, nullification, using the Constitution that made the officers in Holly Springs safer because they don't have to go out there and they don't have to harass people of color while driving while black. They don't have to go out there and look for drugs. They don't have to go out there and do any of these things because civil asset forfeiture is also the government stealing more than criminals, hardened criminals, from anybody and everybody in the state of Georgia. Thank you. Governor Kemp, 30 seconds. Well, thank you. Uh, I would just let people at home know the largest, fastest growing segment of the population that's buying handguns and firearms is African Americans and females. You know why? because the criminals are the only ones that do have the guns. You have local governments that are holding up concealed weapon permits that are keeping law-abiding citizens from being, being able to, to simply uh, uh, use their Second Amendment right to protect themselves and their property and their families. I will certainly support that. Because Thank you. Mr. Hazel, may, may I respond? Yes, you 30 seconds. Let's be clear. I believe that we can protect the Second Amendment and protect second graders at the exact same time. That means that, yes, more people are buying guns, but that's because they think that's the only way to protect themselves because guns have flooded our streets. These are communities that want to be safe. They don't want to have to carry weapons. I know how to shoot. My great-grandmother taught me. But I know that the person who is most responsible is the person who holds the weapon. And that is why I will quote Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. And because of the criminal carry law that Brian Kemp signed into law, there is no longer a background check for those who have concealed carry permits. That makes all of us Thank less you very safe. Much. How are you going to take much. the guns? Don, if Bellamy. I could respond. How, how should we take the guns? That's that a great really question. really want to move on. Well, there, there is a federal background check. There is a federal background check on every individual that buys a firearm in the United States of America. Which shouldn't exist either. So, so, that is not true. Well, the, the point, Mr. I, Mr. I Kemp, that's not true. I understand the, the point you're making, but the point is, when you buy a firearm, you get a background check. Mr. And Kemp, none, of, right. none of the laws More changed. On Mr. Who, Kemp, if you purchase a weapon in Georgia through a gun sale or a private sale, well, through a gun Abrams, show or a private sale, a, you're not right, subject we're, to that. We're going to have to move on. I interrupted you tonight. And I, I apologize. Candidates, we have to move on. I'm going to allow. I'm going to allow Jennifer to ask. Uh, what's going to be the final question in this round? Uh, a study recently showed frustration among our nation's teachers with political interference into education with issues like COVID-19 and critical race theory presenting additional challenges to a profession that's already dealing with low pay, falling interest, and people leaving. What would you do specifically as governor to recruit, retain, and empower educators for, for schools across the state of Georgia for each of you? Shall I? All right, we'll start with you, Ms. Abrams. And let me again, again apologize to Mr. Kemp for interrupting. Mm, this is a very important topic to me, and I apologize for my outburst. I will say that when it comes to education, we know teachers are leaving the workforce. We have a 67% retention rate, but 70% of our teachers have said they would not recommend teaching to their colleagues. That is because of low pay, because of overregulation, because of high stress, and because they believe that they are being told to teach to a curriculum that does not reflect the values and needs of our students. When a teacher is told that you have to lie to a child 
which is what happened with the divisive language, the divisive concepts legislation. Teachers are not being able to teach the whole history of our students. They're not able to tell their children what they need to know. As the next governor of Georgia, I will repeal those laws. I will increase pay, and I will make certain that all of our teachers can start and continue through their time, well-paid and well-protected and well-supported by the governor. Unfortunately, we, we're running out of time, so only 45 seconds. So, um, Brian Kemp. Well, I would just say this is exactly why I did the $5,000 teacher pay raise that I ran on in 2018. Uh, we've also done a parent's bill of rights to have parents fully engaged with their schools to make sure that they know what's happening to their kids. Quite honestly, people are tired of their kids being indoctrinated in the classroom. But we've also worked with our educators on these pieces of legislation to make sure that they make good common sense. But I would also tell you, that people are tired of these issues like not having fairness in girls' sports and other things. And quite honestly, it's woken a lot of people up. So we got to continue to have good conversations like we've done with our teacher pipeline legislation, like we're doing with helping 9,000 pair pros get fully certified to be in the classroom. Thank you very much. Shane Hazel, you get 45 seconds. Your question raises a lot of interesting points. A lot of these teachers, like my own wife, has left the profession of teaching to homeschool, to go to private school, to do something outside of this narrative where admin from the federal government and the state government is forcing them to teach things they don't want to teach, to teach to test. They can't stand the administration who makes six figures. It is bloated. It has absolutely gotten out of control. We need to nullify property tax. We need to let people get out of the system. We need to allow the private sector to work. Because before education was put under the thumb of government here, we had some of the brightest, most well-read people in the entire world. And that's what we need to bring back. All right. Thank you very much. We are running out of time. So that is all the time we have for questions. Each candidate will now have only 40 seconds for a closing statement. And Brian Kemp, you get the first closing statement. Well, first of all, let me thank the Atlanta Press Club for having us. When I ran for governor in 2018, I promised to put hard work in Georgians first ahead of the status quo and the politically correct. I said shortly after being sworn in, I would work hard as your governor every single day for all Georgians, whether you voted for me or not. I'm so optimistic about the future of our state, the lowest unemployment rate in the history of the state, the most people working, and economic opportunity in all parts of our state, no matter your zip code or neighborhood. Stacey Abrams said Georgia's the worst state in the country to live. Well, Marty, the girls and I disagree. We think Georgia's the greatest state in the country to live, work, and raise our children. And that's why I'm asking for your vote and support to keep it that way. Thank Thank you. you, and God bless. Thank you. Stacey Abrams, 40 seconds. I, too, want to thank everyone tonight for your support. And I want to point out that Brian Kemp did make promises. He promised to keep us safe, but crime has gone up. He promised to protect us, and yet he's attacked our freedoms. He has promised to take care of our families, and yet the rising prices in Georgia are rising because he refuses to expand Medicaid, because he refuses to tackle the affordable housing crisis that we have, and he's sitting on $400 million of our money that he will not spend to keep us under roofs and in our homes. As the next governor, I want us to have more, more money in our pockets, more protections in our lives, more freedoms in our days, and more opportunity in our communities. I see all of Georgia, and as the next governor, it will be my intention to serve all of Georgia. I encourage you to go to my website, stacyabrams.com, and please make a plan to vote, and know that I'm asking you for your vote tonight. Thank you. Shane Hazel, you get the final 40-second closing statement. Georgia, you are essential. We are in changing times. Technology, money, politics are all changing incredibly fast. As humans, our superpower is our ability to adapt to a changing world. This power to adapt, our passion and genius is unleashed when it is free. Free from tax, free from government and their lockdowns, free from government mandates, and free from force and coercion. You know best how to adapt and run your life, and that is your right to do so. It is time peaceful people were free to take on the challenges we face. Our message to the government is simple. It's time to leave peaceful people alone 
If you believe the government we, is so damn essential, we have to go. I'm stop sorry. Stop robbing us at Thank the point you. of a gun and compete. With that us concludes our debate. Market. We'd like to remind voters that Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th, and early voting has already begun. Our thanks to the candidates and to our panel of journalists. We'd also like to thank the Atlanta Press Club for arranging today's debate. For more information about the debates they will host this election season, visit atlantapressclub.org slash debates. I'm Donna Lowry. Thanks for joining us for the Atlanta Press Club debates. We press on for you because it's our mission. Dedicated to investigation because the facts matter. Fueled with determination because it's our calling. Driven by passion because you deserve to know what's really going on. Your support matters. Thank you. Georgia Public Broadcasting is proud to partner with the Atlanta Press Club to present its annual political debate series. Visit gpb.org for a complete broadcast and live stream schedule. As the midterm elections approach, we'll be answering your election questions. What do you want to know about voting? How will new laws impact you? What issues matter most and where do candidates stand? To submit your questions, go to gpb.org slash elections or text GPB to 855-670-1777 and follow the prompts. The hot summer days are coming to an end and we're looking forward to fall. And we hope you're looking forward to the cooler weather and all GPB has coming your way. Like Friday Night Football and Georgia Outdoors and of course all your other fall PBS favorites. It's your donation at gpb.org slash give that ensures we'll have the funds on hand to continue bringing you all the programs that you love. So please, do your part right now at gpb.org slash give. Your donation is vital and so appreciated. Thank you. For relaxation, for inspiration, for an emotional reboot, check out GPB Classical. Our online music stream is an oasis of beauty any time of day or night. Transcend the everyday with GPB Classical. Details at gpb.org slash classical.